What's up, guys? Welcome back. Another episode of the Average Money Podcast today. JJ and I are both coming from the same location here in New York, and we have a guest as well. Today, we got Marco Zlatic. He is an amazing YouTuber, but not only just a content creator, he also has a wealth of knowledge in the entrepreneurial space, in the, in the higher end thinking of personal finance. And I think JJ uh, and I, we, we, we lack a little bit, but if you are new to the show, my name is Brad Finn. I am joined today with JJ Buckner. JJ, how you doing, bud? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me too, by the way. Oh, yeah. Dude. Welcome to New York. It's pretty crazy. We were talking last time about how Brad and I I've never even actually met in person, <laughs> and now I'm here. So I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited to talk to Marco. Marco, thanks for coming on. And it's early in the morning. We're doing this on a Saturday morning, so I don't think uh, anybody's really drinking any beers yet. But uh, <laughs> hopefully, you have a nice warm cup of coffee. How you doing over there? Good. I can crack open a Pabst coffee if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Pabst Blue Ribbon coffee. No, I'm just kidding. We'll probably start drinking. We stopped drinking pretty late in the evening, as we like to have a couple cocktails. For people that aren't familiar, you do have a, a majority of your known for is your YouTube presence, but there's more that the listeners need to know about you. You want to just uh, give people just a brief overview of like where you're at in the country and also where you're at in your life as far as personal finance is concerned. Yeah, for sure. So thanks for having me, you guys. Um, I've spoken with Brad in the past and I've no, I know JJ. Uh, we were actually at FinCon together last year. So if I'm a little more loosey goosey <laughs> on this podcast, <laughs> actually it's 930 in the morning, so I'll be fine. There you go. But uh, <laughs> just so the listeners know, we all pretty much know each other. So and these two guys are great guys. Um, so I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, born and raised in Cleveland. Um, you know, it's considered the Midwest. You know, I feel like we also have kind of like an East Coast vibe, so I can relate to both, you know, JJ and Brad, because Brad's on the East Coast, JJ's in the Midwest. Um, and I think Cleveland is kind of that middle ground, you know. So born and raised there, didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth. My parents are immigrants from Eastern Europe or Southern Europe, I guess, if you want to say that. You know, no connections, no, you know, rich kid in the finance industry whose dad, you know, got him to where he's at. Basically just went to University of Akron, got my finance degree because I always had an inkling for the markets and, you know, entrepreneurship and things like that. So I just felt like getting a finance degree was the next logical step. The reason I got that finance degree is because I wanted to become a personal financial advisor, and I never really scratched that itch. I ended up graduating in December of 2010 um, during the peak of the recession when unemployment was at its highest after 07, 08, and I actually ended up having to sell cars. So I have a finance degree. I'm selling cars. You know, it's fine. You know, selling cars is okay. You can make a lot of money, but it just wasn't the most fulfilling career path. So ultimately went from that route um, into the startup world, um, learned all about venture capital and all that good stuff. I worked for a startup that got acquired by a publicly traded company um, and then everyone got laid off, me included. So wow. um, took some unemployment, you know, went to Florida to visit my buddy, you know, worked out, went to the beach, you know, looked for jobs online and then ultimately um, started working in commercial real estate development. Um, so I worked with a boutique firm. Uh, we owned about 750,000 square feet of office and uh, retail and mixed use property types, uh, managed that entire portfolio. I was basically the leasing and sales director, did all the acquisitions, dispositions, all that good stuff. And then basically in 2016, I believe we sold our entire office portfolio and went into senior living, um, new construction ground up. So I have a little bit of experience there, um, underwrote a million deals. I was the guy like representing that firm during like zoning and, uh, you know, city meetings and all that stuff. So you learn a little bit about politics. You learn how to underwrite these deals, which is really good experience. And you're basically working with, you know, all the big boys and big girls in construction and development and all that stuff. So it was really good experience. Uh, after that, I ended up working for Marcus and Milchap. They're a publicly traded company. Um, they basically do all commercial real estate services. I worked in their capital markets firm, uh, or arm, excuse me, and I did commercial mortgage analysis and commercial mortgage lending. So instead of residential lending, like on a single family home, for example, we were working with you know multi multi million dollar mortgages on you know office buildings, retail, strip plazas, things like that. You've been busy, Marco. You've been busy. Yeah, dude. Yeah, it's uh, it's good. It's good because it's a lot of really good experience. So it's interesting working from like startups to publicly traded companies and seeing like the difference in dynamic and how those companies are run. That's and then huge. finally, I ended my formal um, career at Key Bank, publicly traded uh, bank here in Cleveland. And I worked in uh, middle market commercial uh, analysis. So the commercial loan analysis, excuse me. So I'm working with companies that are making anywhere from like a million to about a hundred million dollars in revenue. 
and we would underwrite you know, their deals and see if they're credit worthy. So just like you would go to a mortgage lender to see if you can afford a home, um, if you can get the mortgage, that's kind of what I did for like middle market businesses, if you will. So during that whole time in 2017, I started Whiteboard Finance out of a passion project just to scratch that itch of, you know, never becoming a financial advisor, <laughs> you know? So it's kind of like, I'm like, hey, you know, screw it. I bought this big ass whiteboard on Craigslist. I got this uh, nice camera camera started to collect dust and I'm like, no, you got to do something with this. So that's when whiteboard finance started. The, that's awesome. You're the OG whiteboard, right? You are the yeah, tri- triple OG. There you go. You are the, the first. And <laughs> I, uh, you said that we kind of know each other, so I could ask you this and, and not to throw any YouTubers under the bus. So you could just throw me under the bus, but with, <laughs> with that background in personal finance, does it frustrate you when like guys like me that are physics teachers come on YouTube and like, claim they know what the hell is they're talking about this no dude i watch does your finance degree like help you in youtube or can anybody really learn on their own and present good information yeah for sure no dude i feel like uh, you're a natural teacher because you are a teacher i feel like you know jj's a teacher i'm a teacher that's all we really are what i will say is the only thing that leaves a bad taste in my mouth with that whole space is people trying to take advantage of others um, it's people that are pumping penny stocks and, you know, uh, buy my course for nine ninety seven when they have no clue what they're talking about. Yes. That's the only thing that frustrates me. I watch your, both your guys' videos. Your guys' videos are good. Otherwise, I wouldn't watch them. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I watched all your like options uh, strategies with the wheel and you know, mm-hmm. Theta Gang and all that stuff. I mean, you, you present your information very well. I think that you don't need the beauty of YouTube is you don't need a finance degree or you don't need a formal education. But at the end of the day, um, the reason why I think people stick around and watch me is because I I know what I'm talking about, which is good. But at the same time, I can present kind of like real life experience and what I'm talking about to add an additional layer of learning as opposed to kind of just someone like reading a CNBC article and saying, okay, these are the, this is what happened today. Let me regurgitate that in a YouTube video. You get to put your own twist on it, you know, because you know exactly what's going on. So you can really get into deep details and say, this is kind of my thoughts on what's, what's happening. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I, I, I'm happy for, I want everyone to start a YouTube channel. I tell everyone it's the, it's the best way to grow yourself as a subject matter expert um, and become recognized if that's what you want to become. I think YouTube's honestly one of the single greatest businesses any person could make. It doesn't even, not even the finance space. I mean, yeah. anywhere like this, YouTube is just a whole another animal that I think is so like, even though as big as YouTube is, I think a lot of the later generation, like including the my age, friends my age are like, what the hell? How'd this guy, you know, how are you making money off YouTube? It's just so unknown of how the type of business you can create by having a personal brand around whatever topic you enjoy talking about. And that's another cool thing is nowadays, luckily we, li- we live in a time where if your passion is basket weaving or whatever it is, there's other people out there like that, that are looking for someone to kind of represent that space. And then you can take that kind of brand action from your personal brand, turn it into whatever your passion is. And now you're making money doing something that you absolutely love to talk about. And I'm so glad that you said that because sometimes I do feel guilty. Like I, I see people that are, but not to say that I I don't do the research. Like I, I don't need to feel validated, but I'm always curious, like people with finance degrees, like, look at this boy over here. Like (laughs) what what is he talking about? And there's one thing that you did, you mentioned that like the whole penny stocks thing, is it, is it more, the philosophy that people are trying to get young people to think that trading penny stocks is a good idea or the courses, like what's your position on like, you know, debt versus investing and, and growing wealth for like a young person. We're, well, you guys are a little bit younger than me, but like somebody that's coming into their twenties, wh- wh- what's your philosophy? What do you, what are you usually advising? Yeah, for sure. So at the time of starting whiteboard finance, that was basically November of 17. So that was, uh, let's call it three years ago now. So I would have been like, 28, 29 years old. So I'm 32 right now. So basically I started that because I was at the end of my twenties when you kind of get like in your early twenties, you get your big boy, big girl job and you start making 50, 60, hundred grand a year kind of a thing. And you make all your dumb purchases, you know, you get the nice new Audi or something like that. And you know, you get the expensive car and you're like, Oh my God, why'd I do that? Um, now, you know, you start to realize like, Hey, I have X amount of, you know, student loans. I have X amount of credit card debt. You know, I really need to get my stuff in order and start planning for retirement. Now that I'm making, you know, more money than I was as a bar back during college, for example, (laughs) you know, so we've all been through that. And that's why uh, I think my channel resonates with a lot of people. Um, so to answer your question, Brad, is that I'm a big believer in like Dave Ramsey's outline, his structure, 
But, you know, just having more, I guess, like financial knowledge, you know, just with growing wealth and using leverage and things like that, um, I think that you can still grow your wealth a little bit faster and still be smart about it too. Um, So I feel like Dave Ramsey's baby steps are kind of like finance 101, personal finance 101. Um, And he's more for like the Alcoholics Anonymous of people who've abused a credit card and things like that, which I understand everyone's been down that road. But um, I feel like you can definitely take it to the next level. So I I guess this is a long winded way of saying, like, eliminate most of your debt first, um, as long as it's kind of like, you know, low interest, if it's under, let's call it, you know, four or five percent. And then anything above that you should pay off because you're basically guaranteeing a risk free, tax free rate of return um, as your ROI, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think it's great that you said that too, because Brad and I have had this conversation before, like him and I both started our personal finance journey through Dave Ramsey. I mean, that was like the first stepping stone for us, which I feel like is a lot for most people in our space too. It's really cool that Dave has this way of kind of laying everything out for you. And then it's up to you to kind of take that next step. You know, you can follow the steps and then, then you're done and you kind of just stay on your path or you can become a big nerd and really get into the details and find out how much more is truly out there financially to really exponentially grow your wealth. Yeah. Coming from commercial real estate, these guys are cash poor and they're leveraged up to the gills, literally 80%, you know, loan to value if higher if possible. Um, but you know, they're the ones flying around in airplanes and right. helicopters and all that. My old boss used to literally land a helicopter on top of our building. Wow. Um, and he came from a farm in Ohio, Doylestown. So, but you know, a lot of people got crushed in 2007, 2008 doing that. He's mm-hmm. one of the smart people who was, you know, as Trump says, I'm under leveraged, you know? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So you just got to be smart about it. But I also know people that, you know, I know developers that literally drank themselves to death, you know, like, you know, just were in depression. So it's a debt is a double edged sword is what I'm trying to say. Doesn't it piss you off when you try and portray that on your YouTube? I'm I'm sure that just like (laughs) I, I've made videos where if you slightly go against anything that Dave Ramsey says, the DRAM loyalists come after you. <laughs> and it's, and I, I know you've seen this because we've talked about mm-hmm. it. And it's like, why? I, I'm not saying that he's a bad guy. No, like, I'm for Dave Ramsey, but. Yeah, same. Why can't I just, why can't I, why aren't I allowed to critique it without getting lit up in the comment right. section? <laughs> so I have a theory about that. So, um, you know, it's 9.30 in the morning or 10 in the morning. We're talking about politics, religion, all this stuff you're not supposed to talk about. But, you know, I, I really don't care. So, you know, I'm, I'm Christian. You know, I'm, I'm sure I think JJ is as well. I've seen a couple of your stories at church. And um, I feel like Dave Ramsey's tapped into that, like, religious, like, zealot kind of uh, yes. faction. You know what I mean? Which is fine. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm religious as well. But, um, you know, I feel like the people that defend him, it's like they're defending, like, Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> yeah. like Dave Ramsey yeah. is the Bible. You know what I mean? Like, so um, I did a video called, you know, why Dave Ramsey's wrong about credit cards. And it was a very logical video. It's like, okay, I have literally, swear to God, have never paid one cent in interest on a credit card in my entire life. Okay. Never, ever since I was whatever, my mom made me a co-signer or a co-user at five years old on her credit cards. I've had credit. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. She's smart. She used to work at a bank. So anyway, uh, went all through, you know, college with the credit card, you know, used it for gas, things like that. Always paid it off because I always had a job. And my point is, is that you can still buy day-to-day things that you're going to buy anyway on a credit card. Yes. Get all the consumer protection, get all the points, you know, get all that stuff off and then use it for, you know, a flight or a gift or, you know, whatever, you know, and people are like, no, you're missing the point. You're overpaying, which I'm sure (laughs) is true. But as long as you're buying stuff you would have bought anyway, I don't get it, dude. It's like, why wouldn't you use a credit card? It's stupid not to, especially as a business owner. The rebuttal they always give is like what you mentioned, but credit cards make you spend money on things you wouldn't have. Studies show that Mm -hmm. if you use credit cards, you spend by this much more. And I'm like, well, what if I don't even keep it in my pocket? And what if I just have it on my auto pay or yeah. my bills that are auto pay? What's the big deal with that? Then? Right, exactly. Yeah, I think it just depends on the person. Marco, I, there, I wanted to jump back on something you mentioned earlier about your boss, like landing the helicopters and these guys being in debt up to their eyeballs, but they're also making millions and millions of dollars. Do you kind of have a, I guess, a, a good balance on what you think being a healthy leveraged investor would be, especially in like the real estate space, because that's one of the most popular ways you can leverage your money to, to build your wealth. So do you have a balance like that that you think is healthy for someone, especially someone maybe just starting out? 
Yeah, so I can speak for myself personally, but you know, as you guys know, personal finance is obviously personal. So some people believe that you should only buy rentals or you know real estate as an investment with cash. You know, kind of like Dave Ramsey. Um, other people are max loan to value. You know, I worked in the commercial lending space. You know, people always wanted max loan to value, eighty five percent, ninety percent, if possible. Those are the guys with the big kahunas. Oh yeah, big kahunas, and you know they're very—they're um, not risk averse. They have a big appetite for risk, and they don't care, you know, kind of what happens. So um, my point is, is that it's all personal. So if you know that you can't sleep at night knowing that you have two mortgages, for example, like on a primary and on a um, income property, a rental property, then maybe you should either pay cash or not even go into real estate investing in general. I always believe financially, this is just my finance degree and mathematical brain talking is that, you know, why wouldn't you use max loan to value? I mean, it only makes sense. You know, your leverage returns are going to be way higher than your hundred uh, percent down paying cash returns are going to be. So if you're looking at it strictly from a numbers standpoint, you always go max loan to value. If you're looking at it from a personal finance standpoint and like a personal mental health standpoint, I, I, I just can't give a number because it's all personal. You exactly. Know what I mean? And that's something we talk about here on the channel is you, you really have, what's so important is you have to know yourself as an individual, even with the back to the credit cards. You know, if, if you know you're a spender and you're somebody that can't control, you know, uh, going out to buy yourself something at the grocery store and you see the cookies on the aisle too, and you're going, I'm going to grab those. I'm just on the credit card today. That's what's really important is you have to know yourself as an individual when it comes to your finances. So like you said, yeah, if you can't if you can't sleep at night knowing you have two mortgages, then maybe don't do it until you can pay cash for a rental. You know, you don't have to leverage your money, but uh, there is ways to do it and, and to also be safe with it. Yeah, for sure. One thing I want to ask you too is some of the stuff that you do is kind of like next level for people like me. And I just want to get your take on like the things that are going on that the average personal finance person doesn't really like know about and things that should be concerns. You Mostly I see this a lot, a lot on your Instagram, then you follow it up on your channel, but your Instagram is very heavily focused on like the macro side of things, like what the Fed is doing and different relationships that we should see as opposed to like the economy and our money. And one of the things, I think it was you, maybe it was you that posted like 22% of the money in circulation was, has been posted, has been built this year or printed this year. What are some things that, and we can have a discussion about this because I'm, I'm actually trying to like selfishly pick your brain here. <laughs> <laughs> what are things that a guy like me, a physics teacher, doesn't really know about the back end stuff unless you're really doing the deep down research that you're doing? Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And you guys are honestly flattering me. I'm more of like, I do that stuff as more of a hobby as opposed to saying, you know, I'm an expert. I'll be the first one to tell you that. It's a very, very strong hobby of mine, but no way would I ever label myself like a macro expert. I just follow really smart people. That's all I do. Okay. I'm not like a genius. So if you want to follow the people I follow, I follow a lot of smart macro economists on Twitter. Um, and for anyone listening to this, you may, you may think I'm an idiot, but Twitter is by far the best educational resource or informational resource, not educational informational resource on planet earth. And it all depends on who you follow. If you're following Kim Kardashian's butt, you know, obviously that's going to be your timeline. You know, if you're following, you know, LeBron James, that's what you're going to get. Yeah. My point is it all depends on who you follow. So to answer your question, Brad, I think that the things that no one talks about, like in personal finance or in macro or in the space that we're in is that no one talks about, I know you're not supposed to say it's different this time. Cause that's supposed to be like, you know, some bad phrase or whatever, but, you know, given where we're at with technology and uh, what we're doing with macroeconomics and just how the global economy is coming together, I think it really is different this time just because technology is the big regulator, if you will. Like before you get news printed on a printing press and it comes out on a piece of paper and Hey, get your plain Cleveland plain dealer or New York times or whatever. Now we live in a time to where technology is destroying all of that. Now everyone is super almost hyper informed almost to a fault you can see it with politics and social media and all that stuff how it's shaping everything but my point is it's also changing finance as well um, with decentralized finance so if you look at things like cryptocurrencies you know like bitcoin and things like that that really is the game changer when it comes to the classic or traditional structure of money so i know i'm not going to be some like 
Bitcoin maximalist, maximalist with my tinfoil hat and, you know, conspiracy theories on this podcast. It's just too early anyway. If this was like 8 p.m., you know, maybe this would be different. <laughs> part two. We got part yeah, two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But my point is, is that a lot of things are changing. And when you see, um, when you follow interest rates, that's really what you need to follow is interest rates and the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. But that's going to introduce a bunch of different things that are going to be probably just too heavy, A, for me to explain, and then B, you know, probably your average listener. And this isn't a good or a bad thing. I'm just saying it may be above their heads. We're going from personal finance 101 to macroeconomics 401, if right. you will. Oh, yeah. um, so that gets into modern uh, monetary theory. Uh, you can argue about Austrian economics. You can argue about classical uh, economics. There's, there's the traditional school. My point is, is that when you print trillions of dollars, our like lizard monkey brains can't even process how many zeros that is. Okay. So when you look at, I, I remember this one meme that I posted, I forgot the exact numbers. I'm going to butcher this, but it's just to prove a point. You know, you have, you know, a thousand minutes was an hour ago. You know, I'm just making this up. I know 60 minutes isn't an hour, but when you get to like a million minutes, it was like, you know, a month ago, a billion minutes was a year ago. A trillion was like before humans existed, you know, that kind of a thing. So we just printed, you know, $3 trillion. They're about to print another few trillion, whether Biden or Trump gets back into office. My point is, is that at some point you have to pay the piper when you're a traditional um, or an Austrian economist. If you're a believer of modern monetary theory, where they believe that, you know, basically, oh, you just, it's like a debt jubilee, you just keep printing the debt, you don't have to pay back anyone, you know, you're just using it as a form to kind of pay taxes with, you know, that's when you start thinking like, okay, is this, does this even sound natural or organic or the natural flow of money? It's kind of like disrupting the, the water cycle, you know, how like the cloud gets heavy and it Mm -hmm. rains and then the rivers flow and then it evaporates and, you know, it's a natural cycle. I feel like the Fed is almost disrupting the natural cycle of business. It's almost like when a forest fire happens, it's actually healthy for the fire or for the forest, excuse me, because it provides nutrients. The Fed is kind of not allowing businesses to fail and they're becoming these zombie companies that can literally only service the interest on their debt and never reduce the principal on the money they're borrowing. Um, So I know this is like, I'm going, I'm all over the place. No, I mean, Uh, because you're blowing my mind too. And like, what I'm getting from you is that we're kind of making money. Are we, are we just lowering the value of the dollar or are we just creating like what's when you said that we have to look at interest rates and things like that? I understand the whole, we're printing a lot of money and maybe we shouldn't be doing that, but where does the interest rate, where does that come into play? Yeah. So the reason interest rates are low, if you pull up a chart, if your listeners want to actually look into this stuff, all you have to do is type in uh, Fred, uh, St. Louis federal reserve, Um, They come out with all these numbers and they have all the charts to show, you know, historic interest rates and all that good stuff. So if you look at after every recession, rates get dropped significantly. After 08, they got dropped to basically zero. That's called zero interest rate policy. That's what we're in right now. Again, remember when the stock market crashed in December of 18, when everything went down, Mm -hmm. that's the last time the Fed raised rates. Okay. So interest rates are basically, if you look at the Fed funds rate, that's basically the rate at which commercial banks uh, get their money at. So if you have the Federal Reserve lending at, let's call it 0.05%, uh, JP Morgan gets that for you know a little bit higher than that. And then they um, do the arbitrage to the end consumer. So Brad, when he gets his mortgage, he's borrowing at 3%. JP Morgan got that at 0.05% or somewhere in that range. The bank is making the difference in the spread. Does that make sense? Yes, yes definitely. Yeah. So the reason interest rates get dropped so low is because uh, we're a debt-based economy or a debt-based society, meaning that you know the reason we started our finance channels is to help people get out of debt. That's because everyone has debt. <laughs> everyone mm-hmm. has car loans. Everyone has mortgages. Everyone has layaway. Everyone has you know financing on you know a toothpick because that's kind of like what we're taught. So my point is, is that that is the lifeblood of the economy is borrowing and getting the new iPad, the new iPhone, the new car, the new phone, the new this, the new that. That's what keeps the economy circulating, which keeps the economy going. Now, what we're seeing after COVID is that the M2 money supply, that's basically just money in circulation. It almost went up like a hockey stick. However, the velocity of money, meaning how much that dollar is being traded throughout the economy has gone down significantly. So we're not seeing, you know, hyperinflation, you know, just yet because the money that's in the supply is not being circulated within the economy, if that makes sense. I mean, it makes complete sense. Well, I want to ask you this though then, Marco. So for everybody listening, 
after hearing all that and kind of really understanding, you did a pretty good job breaking it down. What does that mean for the regular Midwest boy, JJ and, and Marco, and then your East coast, New Yorker, Brad, what does that mean for the typical guy in America? Is this something we could fight? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> or what is it going to do to our, our pocketbooks? What does it do to our wallets? You know, what, what what's going to happen? Yeah. So it forces, uh, everyday people like JJ, like Marco, like Brad to become investors. You know, I have multiple videos saying savers are losers and cash is trash. And I hate saying that because I'm naturally a saver. My parents are immigrants, dude. We have no debt. You know what I mean? I have no debt. Yeah. Um, the reason for that is because you learn to live without and then, hey, you want a new car, you pay for it with cash. Mathematically, it doesn't make sense. But anyway, to answer your question is it's forcing people to be involved in the market, whether they want to be or not. So if you look at these low interest rates, if you just follow the interest rates, you can literally match it up to the S&P 500 uh, chart. It's almost like a joke at this point. So basically what I mean is low interest rates cause um, assets to go up, to inflate. So people are saying, hey, Marco, you know, what you're saying is not true. My Happy Meal is still, you know, $3. My uh, dozen eggs is still 2 bucks at the store. What are you talking about? Where's the inflation? Uh, have you looked at housing prices lately? <laughs> have you looked at the stock market the past 10 years? Um, people are getting so like perverted in their mind of like what is supposed to be good returns. Like, oh, I only made 600% today on my Tesla calls. You know what I mean? <laughs> like to 600%, you don't make that your entire investing <laughs> right, career right. You know, up until 2010 and on. Um, so my point is, is that this is a long winded way of saying invest in assets because those are the things that are inflating. Okay. So that's why, uh, this may be a good segue as to why my wife and I bought a house. I was just getting ready to go there. <laughs> yeah, we took out 30. I looked at my portfolio. So just, I know I'm all over the place, but for your audience, you, you need to look at your portfolio as like a pie. Think of it as a big pie and you have to carve out, even before you start investing your first dollar, what do I want my pie to look like? Do I want a little bit of real estate? Do I want gold? Do I want equities? Do I want crypto? Do I want, you know, classic automobiles, whiskey? I don't know. You can invest in a bunch of things, classic art. I don't know. My point is, is that you need to determine before you invest your first penny, what do you want to be invested in? And now we're traditionally taught the 60-40 portfolio, 60% equities, 40% bonds. That's called the risk parity portfolio. Over the past three, four decades, that's done very well, given the economic climate we've been in. Now bonds are getting crushed. Okay. Bond yields are almost non-existent. So you have 40% of your portfolio, which is pointless, which is forcing more and more people to go into stocks. And that's why you see the S and P 500 chart going up over the past 10 years. So to answer your question, finally, JJ, sorry. No, God. Um, no you're good, man. Is that I I'm investing back now into tangible assets. So I used to have a portfolio of rentals. Uh, when I worked for my real estate development company, we built these things ground up. We were building spec homes. We were building duplexes. I have a video about it on my channel. Um, uh, we sold all that stuff in about 2016, I believe 2017. I can't remember and went straight to cash. And then I invested a lot of that back into the market, uh, which has done well over the past couple of years, but I had 0% of my portfolio in real estate. And now given the economic climate, um, I think things that are like tangible or hard assets, um, such as, you know, precious metals, real estate, and also even Bitcoin now is becoming one of those, it's fitting into that puzzle piece, if you will, as part of my portfolio. So I took a bunch of cash that I had sitting in my um, high yield savings account. And when I say high yield, I mean, it went from 1.5% to 1.25 to 1 to 0.5. Yep. You know, we all know it was capital. It's one. a yield savings account. Now. It's yeah, just a yield yeah. savings account. It's a it's a don't keep up with inflation and lose two and a half percent of purchasing power. Exactly. Every year savings account. <laughs> um, so with that being said, it's capital one. I think Brad has capital yep. one as well. So basically, I took that cash that was sitting in that account and just wanted to redistribute that to the real estate portion of my pie again. So I did that. And now, and I know I'm going off a huge tangent, but just to finish the thought here, I took out a 30-year um, fixed rate mortgage at 2.49%, uh, shout out to Key Bank. And now that is a f hedge against inflation. So think about this. Insane. So if, if inflation happens, say we go through, I'm not even talking hyperinflation. I'm talking just, you know, the rate of inflation is higher than normal. My, I'm locking in 2020 debt for 30 years and knock on wood, if my wife, who's a nurse practitioner, gets a 2% raise every year at year, you know, let's call it year 10 or 20 or whatever. It doesn't even matter. 
our debt, that household debt, that mortgage is simply becoming a smaller and smaller portion of our household income. If my income were to stay the same, if that makes sense. Yes. It's insane. I mean, it really is insane. And the 2.49%, that's the lowest rate I've heard of since, you know. And, and that's with that's with like 500 bucks of points, dude. That's not yeah. even like $8 million in points. That was It was like a 2.62 and I paid like 500 bucks to get it to a 2.49. But you'll see, you guys, I'm telling you, they can't raise rates. The Fed said no we're not way. raising rates till 2023. They can't. Just the way the economy is, they can't afford to do it to where... I don't think this will ever happen, but we may even see negative interest rates in the United States to where, you know, you may be getting paid to take out a mortgage at some point. They've done that in Europe. Well, like you said, look what happened in 2018 when they tried, you know, I mean, the market freaks out, it goes down and I mean, it's, it's just almost can't be done. Now, let me ask you this then. Do you, when do you think we'll be ready to do that? When do you think we'll be able to raise rates? I mean, there's, there's gotta be a point in time where market's looking steady, economy's doing well. Obviously, the whole COVID situation has really messed up some things lately. But whenever we're back on track, why can't I mean, why can't they just raise it and the stock market just kind of take its correction? Yeah, that's a good point. I think uh, there's a lot of people that are a lot more influential than you and I <laughs> that, <laughs> um, that have their say yeah. why they can't raise rates. Uh, but I'm not going to go down that because I already went down Trump, Jesus, and uh, <laughs> we're touching all the levels today, man. Yeah, by 10:20 a.m. You yeah. haven't mentioned vegan yet, so make sure you throw <laughs> that in somewhere, <laughs> just so everyone can hate you. Make sure you talk about vegans as well. Yeah, my favorite meme is like uh, there's a bunch of urinals. You know, there's like 20 urinals, and it's an empty bathroom. One guy's at the one end. The other guy walks all the way to the other end and pisses right next to him. It says, uh, "Hey, I'm a vegan." <laughs> <laughs> Well, there it is. And yeah, you, um, you mentioned Bitcoin. I am somebody that's like two, I guess two years ago is probably when we first started hearing about like, oh my God, Bitcoin's going up to a million dollars, blah, blah, blah. And I think that was kind of when I got into investing and it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. If you were speaking to somebody like me that has a bad taste in their mouth or has only heard bad about Bitcoin. I know it's been recently in the news that a bunch of big companies are starting to put it in their balance sheets and things like that, which is going to kind of force a snowball effect where people are going to start having to take Bitcoin seriously. Like, can you talk to me as far as having a bad taste in my mouth and not really understanding what Bitcoin really means and why it, it might be something I at least should maybe do some research about? Yeah, I, I definitely recommend everyone at least research it to understand why, in my opinion, it's the most sound form of money you know ever created. If if it's not going to be a currency, meaning used to transact or become money, um, it's at least going to be a digital store of wealth. So just like the old school gold bugs are like, this is God's money. You know, no one's making any more gold. You know that kind of a thing. You know, I really feel like in this digital age where I mentioned it's different this time earlier in the podcast that we're getting into. Again, technology being the great equalizer, if you will. Um, I really feel like everyone should at least do their homework on it. Um, people associate Bitcoin with like scams and things like that, which there's definitely a ton of, but there's also scams with US dollars, mm -hmm. with penny stocks, with you know things like that. There's scams with everything. My point is, is that Bitcoin is basically a trustless form of money, meaning that I don't need to trust, you know, Brad or JJ. All I need to know is the number to his wallet and he's going to get this Bitcoin and our transaction is complete. That's it. Uh, there's no bank that needs to verify it. There's no wire. So I just bought a house. We had to wait for a wire to go through. Why is that? It's 2020. Like, how does that even make any sense right now? You right. know, my point is, is that as long as I have, you know, an address, there is no central entity controlling the flow of Bitcoin and everything is verifiable by the ledger and blockchain system. So everyone can verify at 1023, uh, Saturday, October 24th at 1023 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, this wallet sent that wallet X amount of Bitcoin. Okay, and that's it. And you verify the ledger and it's always on the blockchain forever, for eternity. You don't need to do any shady backdoor deals or try and figure out, okay, is JP Morgan getting a cut of the stimulus? What's going on? Where's my money going? That kind of a thing. The reason that is becoming more and more appealing is because when you have all this money being printed, people are starting to lose trust in the central institutions, aka the Fed, that are you know controlling our monetary policy, if you will. So this is for people that, let's say you're a business owner, you just sold your business for uh, 20 million bucks. 
And you want to, do you want to put all that in stocks? Probably not. You know, do you want to put it all in real estate? Probably not. You know, this is a way for you to be able to store your wealth for generations to come. So I feel like everyone needs to go back to what I said earlier and really think about how they want to construct their portfolio. Um, and that way you can actually allocate a little bit to Bitcoin. So uh, my theory is that, okay, if Bitcoin goes to zero, no big deal. I lost, you know, 5% of my portfolio. It's not going to kill me. You know, I'm not going to lose my sleep at it. But if it goes to 100,000 per Bitcoin or 500,000 or whatever, I'm not saying it's going to, I'm just saying, what if it does? Right. Um, Bitcoin could easily be a candidate for the next world reserve currency. So you mentioned, you know, having a small percentage of, you know, Bitcoin in your portfolio. And I'm a big advocate of, advocate of that as well. You know, I, I'm, I speak out about how like speculative investments, uh, you know, things like cryptocurrency is I, you know, you hear some people talk about like, oh, you shouldn't do anything like that. But I like having a very small percentage of my overall portfolio, my overall wealth in something like Bitcoin or in a little bit of a maybe more speculative investment. Because like you said, if Bitcoin goes to zero, all right, I just lost that little bit of a percentage, but it's not going to hurt me over time, over the long haul. It's not going to take a big pull out of my pocket to where the upside of that, the potential upside is there also to where if it ends up going the right way for you, you're going to come out looking pretty far ahead for just even just having that real small risk adverse, you know, of your portfolio being invested in something like that. And I'm also a believer in digital currency, Bitcoin. I can see how, where it's going and the technology advancing and more, more and more companies coming onto it. So I'm really glad, I'm really glad you, you mentioned that. The one thing that's interesting to me about it is the fact that it's kind of like a worldwide currency too. So we don't have to worry about, you know, dollar conversions to the Euro to whatever. It's kind of like a, it's a global, yes. it's a global thing that we can do. And I, another thing that I want to ask, what is the difference between, cause I, Bitcoin's not the only in cryptocurrency, right guys? So like, why is Bitcoin just like, are they the Beatles? Are they the first one to do it? And that's why we're into Bitcoin. Is that really it? Yeah. So a lot of people, so some people presented the, I guess the theory that, okay, you had, uh, ask Jeeves, you had Yahoo, you had web crawler, you had, uh, you know, all these different search engines. Why does everyone use Google now? It's just because it was a better version of, you know, the first search engine It's better than web crawler. It's better than Yahoo. It's better than whatever, uh, Bing, if you will. So people are saying like, what if there's a better, you know, cryptocurrency that comes around that transacts faster or has, you know, less of a um, fee, you know, for transacting, using it, that kind of a thing. Um, and that rebuttal is typically that Bitcoin, there's only going to be 21 million ever made. And it's already stood the test of time since basically its inception, you know, for over a decade now. Um, so with that being said, you know, it's been under attacks. It's been under, you know, a bunch of different things and it's always been resilient other other popular cryptocurrencies, there's not a finite number of them, uh, meaning it's not deflationary. So like every every four years, Bitcoin goes through a halving. So miners who are verifying these ledgers, these transactions that I made an example of me and JJ, you know, they get rewarded with Bitcoin after they verify so many transactions. That's how Bitcoin is mined into existence, just like gold, if that makes sense. So with all that being said, the, you're becoming rewarded less and less and less as time goes on. And there's only 21 million ever made, meaning that it's a deflationary um, asset, meaning that you can't just print 3 trillion of it out of thin air, making it worth less. It's going to be only become worth more over time because it's scarce. There's only 21 million ever. Um, so I know that didn't necessarily answer your question of like why Bitcoin, but it's just, it's checked all the boxes of being a long-term asset, if that makes sense. All right. So I'm almost ready to buy Bitcoin. My last question, <laughs> all the people that are hating is like, I've heard stories like if you lose your wallet number or something like I always hear people like, oh, I lost my Bitcoin. Like, what does that mean? Yeah. So there's, so Bitcoin is interesting because it's not the most user friendly. You have to be somewhat um, tech savvy to use it, meaning that you have um, a Bitcoin wallet where you can send and receive money from. So you send money to someone else's wallet, you receive money into your wallet. Just think of it as a bunch of different numbers and letters and it's randomized. Okay. There's, there's billions of these combinations. You can never just guess someone's, you know, wallet. It, it would be almost impossible. But my point is, is that 
um, when people say like, oh, I lost my Bitcoin, that means that it was either sitting on like a hardware wallet, meaning like like a USB stick, if you will, or like somewhere on a hard drive somewhere, um, because those people are taking it off the exchanges. So if you want to look at stocks, our stocks are sitting at a brokerage house or sitting um, on an exchange, if you will. So like Robinhood, M1 Finance, Webull, you know, Schwab, Fidelity, whatever. If you look at like Coinbase, that's a that's a cryptocurrency exchange. If you don't own the keys to your Bitcoin, meaning that if you don't own the keys to your wallet and have your Bitcoin in your wallet and it's sitting on an exchange, that exchange could go away tomorrow, go out of business and you lose your Bitcoin. So what people do is they, um, there's many different ways to store Bitcoin, but the way that I do it is with a hardware wallet. So picture like a USB stick for people that can't, you know, see my fingers or, you know, see the video version of this picture like a USB drive. And you basically take your coins off offline, off your, off the exchange, excuse me, and put it onto cold storage, which is kind of like a USB stick. And now to access that, you have um, a, a password of a number of different words that you memorize to access all that money or the, all that Bitcoin that's sitting on that wallet. So if you forget those words or you don't know how to take it onto the hardware wallet and that exchange goes away, you can lose your Bitcoin that way. Yeah, and, and I do want to say this. This probably sounds like a lot of a lot to people who maybe have never invested in cryptocurrency. Oh, dude, my mind is blown. I have no idea what, the, what you guys and are I'm talking about. And I'm not doing a great job explaining. No, 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 no. You're doing okay. a great job. I'm yeah. just saying it's just that's so much information for someone who may have never even looked into it that I remember. So I bought, I purchased it right before it had the big shoot up in 2017, I think it was, and. I had no idea what I was doing at the time, to be honest. I just kind of heard about it. I was like, yeah, throw like a hundred bucks, whatever in here. And then I started learning about the wallet situation. Honestly, like the best thing that I did was just doing simple Google Google searches on, and trying to learn on how to like read, get your wallet, what the wallet actually meant. And after you read it for it for a while, everything starts to make sense. So, like if you're listening to this podcast right now, you're like, what the hell is he even talking about? Just it does take time to really get a, a solid understanding of how it all works. I was going to say, then you feel exactly the way Brad feels right now. <laughs> so like when you say like an exchange could go away, like, so, all right, I can buy crypto on Robinhood. So if I buy crypto on Robinhood and I own it quote in Robinhood and then Robinhood goes out of business and they're gone, I would lose that. So if I buy crypto on Robinhood, I should also be putting it in cold storage as well. Is what you're saying? Uh, so you brought up an excellent point that I should have touched on. You don't own your crypto on Robinhood. You don't own the Bitcoin. So if I go to Coinbase, I can take that off of Coinbase and transfer it to my wallet. On Robinhood, you don't have the ability to do that. Um, I forgot the exact thing. I'm going to sound stupid now, but you are only trading. Um, I don't know if it's, uh, it's like Bitcoin something. It's not literally the actual coin. It's just the right or something like that. They're just holding it, I believe. I I, I know I'm butchering this right no, now. There's but- some good videos on YouTube about that, about how why buying cryptocurrency on Robinhood is not, you know, not the greatest way to do it if you really want to buy buy okay, cryptocurrency. Okay, so if I'm gonna, so if I'm gonna buy it, you keep mentioning Coinbase. Coin is that where you go get? Is that where you start with your research? That's just that's just one exchange. Like there's there's a bunch of them. There's Kraken. There's uh, BlockFi. There's a million of them. So, and you mentioned that there's only a fixed amount of Bitcoin out there. So. Obviously, I'm sure one Bitcoin is a lot. You're pretty much always buying a fraction of a Bitcoin. Is that true? Like the only here, you can buy multiples if you got enough money. <laughs> <laughs> My only like Bitcoin purchasing uh, like experience is watching Dave Portnoy do it with the uh, with the guys from the Facebook when they because apparently the guys oh. from the Facebook own the the, the Winklevoss brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apparently they own like. A quarter a of, of the world's Bitcoin, Jeez. and they were getting Portnoy just like dropped two hundred and fifty k on. Oh yeah, sure. And they were like, okay, do it. And I think they might have had they might the Winklevoss twins. They might have an exchange today. I, I I frankly need to lose learn about it as well. So it's like that's why I'm glad we have these conversations because yeah. this is so like mind blowingly interesting for me. But Marco, are you still thinking that like? it still should be a speculative play. Like, should people be heavily invested in Bitcoin or should it primarily just be, you know, a speculative play with maybe five, 10% of your overall portfolio? Or like you said, it's all about whatever your pie looks like. Yeah, so it just depends on what you believe in. I mean, I I personally have only about, I'd say like five to 7% of my net worth in Bitcoin, not even. But again, that's just how I want to structure my pie. If things start to change and you start to see like the writing on the wall of like, hey, can I really trust, you know, the U.S. dollar or whatever? Like what if the dollar lost its reserve currency status? What if oil was stopped trading in dollars? What if, 
U.S. military wasn't as strong as it is. You know, what do you think is going to happen to the value of the dollar? I think the dollar is so so strong right now because the world trades in dollars. There's an appetite for the dollar. So certain economies peg their um, their money to the dollar. Like if you've ever been to the Bahamas, their their currency exchange rate is basically pegged to the U.S. dollar. Um, all oil is traded in dollars, not all, but most with the petrodollar. So even if I'm in Saudi Arabia, I'm transacting in U.S. dollars, um, buying and selling oil. Um, and that's going to go into another conversation <laughs> yeah, of why yeah. we've been in Iraq and <laughs> Afghanistan for 20 years. But, you know, it's 10, it's 1036 on a Saturday. So. I just I can't, I can't believe like how confusing it can seem, but how so many intelligent people like yourself are at least there and. You were saying before, and I want to follow up on a, just some a thing that you said that there's only a fixed amount, so the value of it can really only go up. But so, how did, why does it trade? Like, why did it shoot up in 2017 and dipped? Does, does it have certain similarities to the stock market in that sense? Because people are still buying and selling it, so the value of it can go up, but people may not want to pay that price. Is that why the is that why the price of Bitcoin fluctuates? Yeah, that's a good question. So it, I mean, it's like any market, it's, it's worth whatever someone is willing to buy and sell it for. So if I, if I say, Hey, Hey Brad, I have this Bitcoin, you want to buy it for a million dollars? You're going to say, you know, go pound salt. If I say, Hey Brad, I have this Bitcoin. Uh, do you want to pay me $12,987 for it? You'll say, Hey, yeah, maybe I, maybe I think that's a fair price. But to answer the other part of the question is that some people say that Bitcoin is an uncorrelated asset, meaning that it's kind of like gold. So gold just does its own thing. It doesn't, um, it doesn't care what the stock market's doing. It doesn't care what's going on in the world. It's just its own little uncorrelated asset, unlike stocks. Say, for example, Greece goes through bankruptcy. That's still going to affect the S&P 500 in some way, like we saw you know, a few years ago. So that's why people are becoming more and more interested in uncorrelated assets to where they don't want to be tied into the market so much. They want to be in things like classic cars or, you know, old whiskey or fine wine or uh, art. Poke, Pokemon cards. Pokemon, oh, Pokemon cards. cards. That's yeah. an uncorrelated asset. Pokemon cards don't give a shit what the market's right. doing. <laughs> if you got that Charizard, yeah. like, you're getting paid, dude, you know? Yeah. Um, so people say that Bitcoin is an uncorrelated asset, but what I've seen, at least over the past couple of years, you know, it almost does exactly, not, not exactly, I'm going to get hated on for this, but I feel like when the market dropped in March, Bitcoin dropped. You can see the chart. You know, when it went back up, Bitcoin went back up. Now with all the news of like MicroStrategy taking $450 million off their balance sheet and investing in Bitcoin, you know, it had a little uptick. When you see PayPal getting into transacting with crypto and Bitcoin, it had an uptick. When you see Square with Jack Dorsey investing $50 million on their balance sheet into Bitcoin, it went up. You know, why do you think it's at 13000 right now? So my point is, I think it's correlated on news, just like any other asset. You know, if someone said like, hey, Marco, um, Samsung Galaxy S9 Pluses are going to be the next big thing, I'm sure this would go up in value too. But my point is, is that it's supposed to be an uncorrelated asset. And that's why people keep it in their portfolio. I love it. Pretty crazy, isn't it? I love this podcast because I freaking every episode, I, I just learned something that's, completely new. That's literally the best thing about interviewing these people, you know, these guys that we have come on that are n- way knowledgeable in their space is we selfishly get to learn about it. So <laughs> it's funny. You, you, you go out to the bar with your buddy and you're having a couple beers and you're like, hey, Marco, how about, uh, you know, we're here, we're at the bar. Could you tell me about crypto? It's like, you're a weirdo, but you put you put you put some head you put some headphones on and a microphone in front of you. You could just talk mm-hmm. about the weirdest things, you know. You could just we could talk about whatever we want if we have headphones and a microphone on. But That's right. The best way to if you want to follow up on this, like I said, this is what Marco's talking about. If you are sick of hearing about what dividend stocks to buy, if you are sick of listening about a passive income streams, <laughs> what's some other cliche videos that I make? <laughs> if, if you're if, how to pay off your debt, yeah. If you all. Make them. We all make them. <laughs> if you've moved past those and you really want to learn more about what the heck we were just talking about, because I have like a whole like list in my head, we're going to find Marco on YouTube as whiteboard. Are you Marco whiteboard finance, right? Yeah. If you type in whiteboard finance, it'll come up. Uh, the reason I changed it. Uh, so I originally had whiteboard finance. 
And then I had that car dealership video that went viral, had like 7 million views. My channel name at that time was my full name. It was Marcos Laddick dash whiteboard finance. Um, people were hitting me up on LinkedIn, dude. They're like, like threats, bro. Like, Oh, oh you know, all wow. these like car dealership managers and stuff. I'm like, let me take the last name out of yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I also got a Walter and a Benelli too in my bedroom. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, now we're talking guns. You can- yeah, <laughs> we're guns. Hitting on all of them. Let's go. Yeah, dude. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and the YouTube channel is great. I we can see the play button, even though it's blurry. I know that's a silver play oh, button yeah. behind you. So you're doing quite well. But you're also you're div- diversifying the opportunity to give uh, information as well. So you also have a pretty strong website. You want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, I appreciate you letting me do that. So um, I started this website a couple months ago. Um, Basically, where I want to take it is with kind of doing mostly reviews on financial products. The reason for that is because not just that, but I feel like people, the most DMs I get are like, hey, Marco, what brokerage do you use? Hey, Marco, should I use Robinhood? Should I use Webull? Should I use this? Should I use that? So that's an outlet just for me to be able to review these things. And, you know, the ulterior motive there is, you know, affiliate links. So if you, if you click on it, I get compensated for that. If you sign up, which is fine, you know, I, I disclose all that stuff. I'm not trying to get over on anyone. My point Marco is Marco said that, to click the link at the end. What a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Smash the like button. Yeah. Dude, my, my, uh, my last couple of videos, I'm like, just click the like button. You know, you don't have to smash it. You don't have to annihilate it. You know, it's got feelings too. J- you know? JJ says hump the you like. Hump it. You, you can do it. <laughs> Whatever you guys want to do to it. I don't give a shit. As long as the highlight's blue, that's all I care about. Give it a little tickle, whatever you want. Tickle the like button. That's right. All right, it's back, um, so back to your website. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so basically, I feel like this podcast has been so informal because I know you guys. Usually, I'm like, well, actually. You know. <laughs> That's what I love about it, though, man. Yeah. HTTPS <laughs> colon backslash backslash. <laughs> yeah, so it's going to be a combination of that, but also I do want to start putting out kind of like my own like not courses, but I'm really considering starting like a school. So not like college or something crazy high level, but just something where it's like super, super easily digestible of like, are you a saver? Are you a spender? Are you a consumer? You know, getting to know yourself better and then kind of walking you through the foundation of like mastering your money and building your wealth. That's like my tagline. You know, I want to help people learn and master their money and then eventually build their wealth. You know, I'm not talking like Scrooge McDuck diving into like a vault of gold coins, but I'm talking like, you know, having a solid foundation that you can pass on to your kids, grandkids, things like that. We're going to link everything um, in the show notes. And real quick, hang on. You're also pretty active on Twitter. So I've been slowly getting more into Twitter lately because I'm seeing just really what type of platform it really is. And I've noticed you've been pretty active on Twitter also. So there's you make a lot of good posts over there as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so you can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Instagram, Whiteboard Finance. And then Twitter is Whiteboard Finn. Um, with one end. <laughs> not yeah, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry, sorry, Trolls bro. out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so thanks, JJ. But um, yeah, I think Twitter, like I mentioned earlier in this podcast, I think Twitter is really the best piece of informational social media that you can get learn from. Um, it's not educational, but it can be just depending on who you follow. Like I said, if you're following Kim Kardashian's butt, you know, you're probably only going to learn about her butt. Right. If you're following the smartest macroeconomists and investors, you know, Ray Dalio, you know, all the guys that run these big hedge funds, you can learn from them as well. Awesome. Thank you very much, Marco. I I really appreciate your time. And also everybody else that's listening at home. Thank you so much. We can be found now everywhere you listen to podcasts, everywhere from Apple to Spotify to we just got onto iHeartRadio. And we have been posting these full video episodes as well on YouTube. Give me a couple of days. Uh, They usually come out a couple of days after just because I have to edit them. But I appreciate everybody and uh, everyone have a great day. and We'll catch you next week.